Friends, Shabbat Shalom. It's nice seeing everybody. You know, in some congregations, you have kind of a summer feel to the, to the uh, services in the summer. I don't, we don't have that here. We, we have a kind of regular experience of, of our worship, which is nice. So I want to remind everyone here uh, what I've been doing over the last couple of weeks and what I'm going to continue to do um, for a lot of the summer. Somehow, I don't even remember exactly how the topic arose, is that there was um, some discussion about what prayers, what prayers we do and what do the prayers mean and, you know, something really basic. You come to synagogue, you open a prayer book, we do the service, we finish the service, and then we, then we ask ourselves, what, what was the experience about? And one of the ways you can begin to examine what the experience is about is to try to figure out what are the words that we are saying and what do they mean, what did they once mean, what do they mean now, and what perhaps will they mean in the future? Because our religious life is basically in Judaism not spontaneous. You know, we have religious experiences that are unscripted in Judaism. Moments of awe, um, experiences of exaltation during the course of our lives. But we are a text people, and therefore over the last 2,000 years, most of our prayer life, our practical Judaism, is guided by a text, by the Siddur, a version of that you have in your hand. And the roots of our prayer book are ancient, or at least 2,000 years old. But of course, there has also been creativity by later rabbis and poets that were added, and there were regional variations. So that's what we're about to undertake um, this evening. So let's look at um, the prayer that we're struggling with tonight. And if I knew how difficult it was going to be, I'd wish I had skipped it. But I need to be honest, and I need to go in order. So I had a work for you guys this evening. And I hope that either you will enjoy the work, or if it's incomprehensible, at least say, Rabbi Landi tried. OK. Or you can say, it was the most ridiculous thing in the whole world. And my self-esteem, I will make it even if that's what you feel. So, there is one blessing that is recited immediately after we recite the Shema. And it is called Emet Emunah. And what I'm going to do first is to read it to you in its most traditional form, okay? And I want you to read, hear it carefully, and I want you to try to figure out what's your reaction to the language that is found here. And, and it's, it's about, the prayer is about how God redeems the Jewish people. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that. So let me um, read this to you and uh, let's go. It says, true and trustworthy is all of this, referring to the Shema and all that the Shema refers to. And we are bound by it, for he, referring to God, is Adonai our God, and there is none like him, and we are Israel his people. He is our savior from the hands of kings, our, our king, our redeemer from the fist of all tyrants. He, he is God who exacts payment from our oppressors, paying all our mortal enemies in kind. He does great things we cannot comprehend and wondrous things we cannot count. He gave us life, not letting our foot slip. He lets us tread upon our enemies' altars, granting us victory over those who hate us, granting us miracles and vengeance over Pharaoh, signs and wonders in the land of the children of Ham. He killed all the firstborn of Egyptian in his wrath and brought his people out of their midst into the eternal freedom. He let his children pass between two halves of the Red Sea, drowning those who chased them and those who hated them in depths. 
His children saw his might and praised and glorified his name and freely accepted his reign. And Moses and the children of Israel joyfully ex answered you in song, all of them singing. And we hear this from Becky and Nathan every week. Mi chamocha ba'elim Adonai, mi chamocha nedar ba'kodesh. Who is like you among the gods, Adonai? Who is like you, Adonai, in holiness, revered in praises, work, worker of wonders? Your children saw your reign, and as the split of the sea before Moses, this is my God, they responded. This is the song of celebration the Israelites chanted in song and in dance once they crossed the Sea of Reeds and the ocean closed on the Egyptians and they were free. So let me ask you this, and um, be honest. What do you make of that prayer when you hear it? What kind of God do we have in this prayer? Not everyone at once. I'm a, pretty, pretty a bitty harsh God. He's going to, he's going to perform vengeance. He's going to drown um, Egyptian children. I mean, it's, 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 it's a brutal God. For, first, the, the, the question that is raised here is, how does God act in the world? We have here described a supernatural God. We have a God who is especially work, working for the people of Israel and at times functions in a rather brutal way against the enemies of Israel. And in this prayer, we acknowledge and praise and a redeemed God who, redeem, who liberates, God, God protects, God does what it takes, even with vengeance. God has no trouble doing horrible things to protect Israel. And in this version, we, we, we Jews have no trouble stating that. Okay. So here is the problem. The problem is well articulated by one of the most distinguished reform rabbis and theologians today, Rabbi David Ellenson, who writes about this. He says, you know, we liberal Jews, when we deal with our prayer book, he says these, the, when people come to write a prayer book that is useful for Jews living in the last 200 years, especially who are in, re, responding to Reform Judaism and all of its creativity, saying these liberal prayer book writers found elements of chauvinism and vengeance within prayer disturbing to their sensibilities and offensive to their conscience. In other words, when, when our reform ancestors, two, at least 200 years ago, started looking at this prayer, they said, what kind of prayer is this? I mean, do we really want, we want a God who is a source of justice, but do we want God associated with vengeance? We want a vengeful God? So there are several approaches that began to arise, several responses to this problem. Response number one is, just read the text and be quiet. Just read it. Don't think so much about it. But understand, and just say to yourself, either you like a vengeful God, maybe some people like vengeful gods, I don't know. We're not gonna take, any, we're not gonna take a survey in a congregation. We survey people about everything else, but not about vengeful God, which, which maybe might be a good survey. Y yes or no, do you believe in a vengeful God or don't you believe in a vengeful God? That might be interesting to find out. Okay, approach number two, take the prayer and just say it in the vernacular. Don't even say it in Hebrew. And just emphasize universal themes. The, the Jews who lived in Hamburg, Germany in the 1819 and 1841, the prayer book that they wrote was very much like that. And the fact of the matter is, is that um, there is a wonderful prayer book written by Rabbi David Einhorn um, in 1896, where this is what he writes. He follows this approach. He says, in truth thou art God, and none besides, and we are thy people. From the hands of mighty oppressors thou hast saved us in miracles without number. Thou has wrought us in the midst of us. Thine outstretched arm led us forth from Egypt in the house of bondage, and wherever our foot would stumble, thy help supported us. So you've got a nice God. He's helping us along. 
We were slaves. He said, okay, it's not good for you to be slaves. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to be a good, this is called the Boy Scout God. The proud, water, the, the proud waters that would have gone over our souls were stayed by thee and all that were in, all that they, and all they that were incensed against us were put to shame and confounded. That's a, a kind of low, a kind of um, G-rated version of this. Um, over our souls were stayed by thee and all that was all that they were incensed against us were put to shame. They weren't put to shame, they drowned. <laughs> For thou was on our side when men rose up against us. So that's one approach to uh, how this was done. Now there is, and not, so far so good, am I making sense? Nothing, nothing utterly um, confusing. There was another approach, and it was approached by one of the founders of um, Reformed Judaism, Abraham Geiger, who basically said, I'm a, he's a reformer. He wanted, he wanted change, but he was very careful not to change the prayer book too much. And therefore, what he would do is edit the prayers, not eliminate them, not translate them into a kind of English that really has no connection to what is being said. He would take the prayer, and he fixed it. Now, I'm going to read you the fixed version of the prayer in contrast to the prayer that I said at the very beginning. Are you with me? At least, at least Glenn, at least you're shaking your head. If someone else could shake your head, I mean, yeah, okay. Lynn, I'm so glad you're here tonight. She's, she's, she's encouraging me on, okay? So this is what, this is the edited version. True and trustworthy is all of this and we are bound by it. For he is Adonai our God, and there is none like him, and we are Israel his people. He is our savior from the hands of kings, our king, our redeemer from the fist of all tyrants. He does great things we cannot comprehend and wondrous things we cannot count. He gave us life, not letting our foot slip, granting us miracles over a pharaoh signs and wonders in the land of the children of Ham, and brought his people, Israel, out of their midst into eternal freedom. His children saw his might, praised and glorified his name, and freely accepted his reign. So he, do you see it? He takes that version of it, and what does he do? He takes out the vengeance, he takes out the, the, the drowning, he takes out all of those things, and yet he maintains the idea that God, that this God is a God who redeems Israel, but he, he redeems them in a kind of Disney-like version of God. Not in a vengeful God, but a kind of nice, benevolent God who looks out for the Jewish people. So that's the deal. Now, interestingly enough, there is a, I have, I've, it's unbelievable what I've done for you guys tonight. It, it scares me. Um, so let's, let's see what he says in um, The Service of the Heart, the 1967, the year the New Reformed Temple was created, prayer book that's used by liberal Jews in, Brit in, the, great, in, in the British Empire, the British, uh, the UK. True it is and certain that the Lord alone is our God, and, and as we, Israel, we are his people. It is he who delivers us from tyrants and oppressors, and as when he led us out of Egypt that he might forever serve him in freedom. Then his children beheld his might and extolled him and gave thanks to his name. Gladly did they accept his rule, and with great joy they all exclaimed. A redeeming God, the Israelites applaud him. That's basically what the prayer comes down to say. Now, are you curious what our prayer book says? Yeah. Oh boy. Oh boy. I'm going to try, my friends. Let's look at the version from the first, the first Shabbat of the month, and then we'll go to the version for um, the Shabbat that we are observing. Turn to page 20 and 21. OK.
this is going to, this is, you're going to have to interpret what you, what you think about this. There is, it's very much like the Hamburg prayer book. No Hebrew for the first part. And then there is an English version that talks about universal ideas. It says, page 20, the eternal truth is that we worship only one God and there is none else. We say that very frequently. We don't even know why we're saying it. It's an English kind of interpolation of Emmet Vemunah. Through God's power alone has our people Israel been redeemed from the hand of oppressors. God is there as the power that helps us to get through, to overcome oppression, especially referring to Egyptians. Great deeds God has wrought in our behalfs and wonders without number. These, he, God continues to help us. God has kept us in life and has not let our people's footsteps falter. The Eternal One was with us during the long years of oppression. Our faith sustained us even when our people suffered the deepest anguish. So God was with us, but it was our own faith that got us through. Not God, but really us. And then it says, and now that we live in this land of freedom, may we continue to be faithful to God and the teachings of the Torah. So what, this, what, the, what the first prayer of the Reformed Judaism says, take out the American flag and wave it. May God's, way, may God's ways guide the lives of all people and unite our hearts in friendship. Our God, our refuge, and our hope, we sing your praises as did our people in ancient days. Becky and Nathan come in. So what is happening here? God who redeems us from oppressors, but we are not certain how, and during difficult times, our faith sustains us, and then it shifts to the celebration of Americanism, which is something that makes me nervous, but that's for a deeper discussion. Um, then, let's go to page 65, to our, to our prayer for this evening that we said, and maybe we said it very nicely, but I don't think we really thought about what it actually means. Page 65, and I love this prayer, but it has nothing to do with the prayer. All this we hold to be true and sure. Okay, they're getting, the beginning is good. Mfe emuna. We have only one God, there is none else. Okay, okay, that's fine. May the righteous of all nations rejoice in God's love and exalt in God's justice. Wonderful idea, has nothing to do with the prayer. Let them beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. A nice idea of when the Messiah comes has nothing to do with our prayer. Let nations not lift up sword against nation nor learn war anymore. Beautiful idea, not found in our prayer book. You shall not hate your brother or your sister in your heart. Who would disagree with that? Has nothing to do with the prayer. The stranger that sojourns with you shall be accepted as your equal, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. A tiny reference to Egyptian bondage, but it's, it's about we were slaves, and that's why we should love our stra the stranger. Very important Jewish idea, has nothing to do with our prayer. Why do you crush my people and oppress the poor, ask God? Well, he's asking a question to those who, who, who oppress us. And, well, that's kind of interesting, but that's not the prayer. The eternal one defends the poor and upholds the rights of the needy. Wonderful idea, has nothing to do with our prayer. So basically, the English part here has totally obliterated what the prayer actually says. Okay, so, uh, no, no. Let's, let's take it easy. Do I think they've done something wrong? No. Have they been honest about the prayer? No. So you have to ask the real question, so what are we actually accomplishing here? And, and this is what I struggle with. And I'm gonna tell you what I, my struggle here is. First of all, when I struggle with this prayer, the first thing that I ask myself is, what does it mean for God to redeem us? Because I have a problem. I don't think God redeems us. I mean, if you live after the Holocaust, I mean, let's get real. God didn't redeem us. I mean, if the reality is, if the Torah keeps, if we keep referring to the God who brought us out of Egypt, I mean, okay, but he didn't bring us out of Auschwitz. So what does it mean for the God to be re 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 redeeming? Is a prayer just a dream, a fantasy? Mm -mm, I'm, I mean, that's a legitimate question. 
And the fact of the matter is, you know, the way I will look at it is the way Maimonides looks at it is that ultimately you have to accept the fact that evil is going to occur because people have free will and that God can't intervene because it takes away free will. So if there's evil in the world, it's evil that, that God, God didn't create it and God can't stop it. Only human beings can stop it. And number two here is, what do we do with prayers that make us uncomfortable? Okay? What do we do with it? Do we remove the prayer and make it something that it isn't? Or do we accept it? Do we alter it? Do we challenge it? It's a major dilemma. So what do we do every week? We get up and we do this prayer. And some of the versions are very inspiring and very beautiful. I don't take away from that. But the truth be told, they don't reflect exactly what the prayer actually means. And the people who wrote this prayer book in a very positive, and I'm not criticizing that at all, said, we can no longer say words that do not, ref that do not reflect what we believe or what we think, and therefore we're going to radically redo it. So the question we confront as a congregation is, is this tolerable to us or not? There are those, in the, and this goes on to a debate, there, there are those who think, and thank goodness this isn't going to resolve, I'll be long retired and drinking uh, and, 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 and sending myself in the Bahamas. No, I won't be doing that. But do we take this prayer book that is the new version that takes us very much back to what Abraham Geiger wanted, that is a pretty close to a, a, a version of the prayer that is edited, but really in its, in, in, it's really a version that you can understand is linked to the original version, or do we take a prayer book and express prayers that are totally different than what were intended? I mean, this, you know, I have to tell you, every week, when I come in here, and I love our service, and I love our worship, and I, and I really love our prayer book. Don't get me wrong. But is it linked to the Jewish tradition in a way that, that it should be? That's a question we really have to ask. And you have to ask the question, what's good for the temple? And what's good for the Jews? And what's good for the future? Is it holding on to the, the traditional structure of the prayer book and embracing it and struggling with the prayers? or to interpolate them in a way where they say something very different that is more in tune with what we believe. That's my explanation of Emet for um, I had to work for, for, I had to work for you to make this happen, but it, to me, is fascinating how this evolution and struggle takes place in Judaism. And this is my final comment. It's okay to struggle. You know, you remember what, you know, we know the word Yisrael, the word for Israel, means you're a God struggler. We're supposed to be struggling with the prayer book. If we came in and we said, oh, this prayer book is great, leave, because you're not struggling with the prayer book. That's my philosophy for this evening, guys. I went, I went too long, but did I do my job? Okay, good, okay, good.